Hello and welcome to our topic, the basic tenets of major psychotherapies. Our objective is to try and gain some understanding of the various psychotherapies commonly used for dealing with emotional problems of different degrees. In the previous chapters, you might have looked at the various schools of thought that have influenced psychology in the last century and continue to influence today. You must have also looked at various mental illnesses and psychological disorders and wondered about their treatment. Treatment of mental illness has varied over the centuries. Right from the time of the Greeks who believed that it was the anger of the gods that created mental illnesses and the treatment being appeasing the gods, people in the Middle Ages believed that people with mental disorders were possessed by evil spirits and demons and drilling a hole in the skull would allow these evil spirits to escape and therefore heal the person. The 18th and 19th century saw a different approach where people with mental illnesses were chained. Treatment was poor. These people remained confined to these mental asylums. However, there was change with the various therapies emerging like psychoanalytics therapy in the last century and several other schools of thought. There has been a positive change in the area of dealing with mental illnesses. The previous century saw the emergence of psychotherapy, drugs and surgery. Psychotherapy is the use of psychological techniques to deal with mental disorders. Psychotherapy may be used in itself or in combination with drugs such as anti-anxiety drugs, antipsychotic drugs or even antidepressants. To understand psychotherapy, it is important to realize that it is an emotionally charged relationship between a trained therapist and a person with emotional difficulties. In today's lesson, we will be looking at two major psychotherapies. One, the psychodynamic approach with specific emphasis on classical psychoanalysis and behavior therapy. Now let us begin with psychoanalysis or classical psychoanalysis. Classical psychoanalysis is based on the principles or the theory put forth by the very famous Sigmund Freud. According to classical psychoanalysis, any emotional problem in an adult can be traced to a significant conflict in the childhood of that individual. This conflict remains in the unconscious part of the mind. Freud believed that it is these repressed unconscious memories and impulses which try to come into the conscious thereby creating anxiety or neurosis as Freud called in the individual. In order to deal with this anxiety, Freud believed that by bringing the unconscious impulses into the conscious, the person became more aware of this and by therapeutic guidance that the analyst provided, the individual would be able to solve his emotional problems. According to Freud, the unconscious impulses are pushed back into the unconscious by the ego defenses. The ego defenses make sure that these unconscious impulses do not come into the conscious and this continues to create anxiety in an individual. So what are the techniques that one can use to bring this unconscious material to the conscious in a manner that the client can deal with it effectively? Freud had four major techniques which enable this process. The first technique that we are going to look at is called free association. Freud used hypnosis initially 
to accomplish this goal of bringing unconscious material into the conscious. However, he was dissatisfied. Instead, he used the technique of free association. In free association, the client lies down on a couch and the therapist sits behind the patient in a manner so as to not disturb or distract the client. The client is then encouraged to talk whatever comes to his or her mind. These thoughts can be irrational, illogical, trivial or absurd. But irrespective of the nature of the thoughts, the client or the patient is encouraged to talk about this. Although it might sound easy, it is not. Because even in our everyday life, we tend to exercise caution and not talk about ideas which we think are inappropriate. However, with practice and guidance from the therapist, the patient is able to continue talking and thereby free associate easily. Although these thoughts might seem random, Freud believed that they were not. According to Sigmund Freud, the mind is divided into the conscious, pre-conscious and the unconscious. The conscious is only the tip of the iceberg, while the unconscious material is the larger material that remains untapped. Hence, these thoughts are directly connected to the unconscious material. It is the need of or the, it is the role of the analyst to identify these threads of connection and narrow it down to the unconscious thought which is creating problem in the client. By this analysis and interpretation, the therapist provides meaning to the patient and the patient is able to resolve his issues in a realistic manner. The second technique used by Sigmund Freud in psychoanalysis is dream analysis. This is an important technique because Freud believed that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. The unconscious wish or desire which could not be expressed in the conscious plane would slowly make its way into the dream in a disguised form. The normal ego defenses that are functional in our waking time are lowered during sleep, but they are not completely lowered. Hence, the repressed material that comes into the conscious has to come only in a disguised form in the form of dreams. It is important to understand two things here, that is the manifest content and the latent content of the dream. What is the manifest content of the dream? The manifest content is the observable part of the dream. The obvious conscious part of the dream is called the manifest content, while the not so obvious unconscious part or content of the dream, the hidden meaning which is symbolic is called the latent content. The role of the analyst is to identify the symbolism and help the client to use free association. After the client free associate, the symbolism in this is identified and the actual unconscious impulse which is driving is identified. For example, the dream of being engulfed in a fire. It could mean that the client is feeling overwhelmed or extremely stressed by the current situation and it is hidden in the form of this dream. The next technique that we will look at is called transference. Freud believed that transference is a very useful tool to get to the emotional part of a client. Transference takes place when the therapist becomes the object of the client's emotional responses. The client tends to transfer attitudes onto the therapist that he or she would show towards significant others in his or her life. These attitudes could be the attitudes that the client had developed towards the parents as a child. As therapy is a complex process, the client talks and shares about things that he or she might never have revealed to anyone in their life. Hence, they begin to form or they begin to have feelings of love or hatred or dependency towards the therapist. As the relationship gets complex, 
and the client begins to transfer these attitudes towards significant others in their life on to the therapist. The therapist is able to identify how the patient relates to people in his everyday life as well as how the, the client relates to people who are significant in his or her life. By revealing this to the client, the therapist is able to make the client understand the basis of his behaviors towards certain people in his life. Transference is considered a very important technique and very useful technique in psychoanalysis. Another aspect of transference to remember is counter-transference. Although a therapist might try to be objective, it is possible that the attitudes from his life might transfer onto the client. For example, the therapist might relate to the patient as he might be relating to his daughter. This is called counter-transference and all therapists, especially psychoanalysts are trained to become aware of this. The next technique and final technique we are looking at is called resistance. Resistance is basically an unwillingness. As therapy progresses, the client is forced to confront certain unpleasant aspects of his life and hence the unwillingness. This resistance can be demonstrated in many forms. For example, the client might fail to show up for therapy, the client might pick a quarrel with the therapist, the client might crack jokes or the client might divert the topic. The role of the analyst is to make the client aware of resistance and his unwillingness and identify what it is that the client or patient is not willing to face and confront. By identifying this and providing guidance and therapy, the therapist is able to make the client confront this and proceed with therapy. We have looked at four major techniques used in psychoanalysis. Another important thing to remember in psychoanalysis is the concept of catharsis. Catharsis is an emotional release. Through the process of therapy and after many sessions, the client might experience what is called catharsis, which is an emotional release that the patient has never ever experienced before. It is very therapeutic in itself and enables the person to move on in the course of therapy. As therapy progresses through the process of working through, the same conflicts are revisited over and over again in different situations. This enables the patient to see the pervasive nature of this particular conflict. And this awareness, in addition to the guidance by the therapist, helps the patient to have meaning or make sense of the issues in life and thereby make significant changes in their lives by gaining insight into their situation. As we all know, psychoanalysis emphasizes on providing insight. By gaining insight to the problem, a person can deal or manage with the problem. That's the essence of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is a very long therapeutic process and it might take a year and above and in most cases runs into several years. Just to summarize psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, classical psychoanalysis <coughs> is based on the theory by Sigmund Freud. The emphasis is on the unconscious part of the mind and the conflicts that arise from childhood. The techniques used are free association, dream analysis, transference and resistance. Let us move to the next major therapy that we are looking at today. This is behavior therapy. Behavior therapy came as a reaction to psychoanalysis 
behaviorists believe that the underlying theories of psychoanalysis were vague and untestable. According to behaviorists, maladaptive behavior is learnt. Maladaptive learning happens when a person is unable to cope with stress. Hence, by learning new ways and behaviors, maladaptive behavior can be removed. So, if you see the difference, psychoanalysis looks at finding the reasons behind certain behaviors, while behaviorists say all you need to do is change the behavior by using the principles of learning. Behavior therapy uses a lot of the methods used in classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Now, according to behaviorists, any behavior continues and becomes stronger if there is a reinforcement, but if there is no reinforcement, the behavior tends to weaken. Hence, to get rid of a maladaptive behavior, all one has to do is remove a reinforcer. The principle of extinction is used in two techniques used in behavior therapy. The two techniques are flooding and implosion. In implosion, the person is made to visualize, relive or imagine the feared situation or the feared object. On the other hand, there is flooding. In flooding, actually made to face the feared object or situation in real life. Let us take the case of fear of snakes. In implosion, a person would be asked to imagine being with snakes or holding a snake. However, in flooding, the person is actually made to encounter a real snake. It might be being in the same room as the snake or even holding a snake. So, these are two important techniques based on the principle of extinction. The second technique we are looking at is called systematic desensitization. The main principle in systematic desensitization is the principle of reciprocal inhibition. In reciprocal inhibition, anxiety is inhibited by a response which is not compatible with anxiety. For example, you cannot be relaxed and anxious at the same time. So, relaxation is the response which is not compatible with anxiety and hence used as a substitute. Patients who are undergoing systematic desensitization are therefore trained to learn how to relax. Progressive muscle relaxation is the technique where the patients are trained to attain relaxation. In this process, the clients are made to contract or tense their muscles and relax their muscles. This is done for all the muscles of the body right from the head to toe. Once the client is trained how to relax, he or she makes up an anxiety hierarchy. An anxiety hierarchy contains 10 situations from reduced to high levels of anxiety. For example, fear of a snake. Number 10 would be seeing a picture of the snake which is least anxiety arousing. Number 9 might be watching a movie about a snake, which is a little higher anxiety arousing. Hence, the list is made till the highest anxiety arousing situation, where for example, number 2 can be visiting or being in the same room as a snake and number 1 would be touching a snake. In therapy, the therapist helps the patient work through the anxiety hierarchy from the lowest to the highest. If the person can experience this situation and be able to relax, then the next anxiety arousing situation is tackled. This process is followed until the client can go to the highest anxiety arousing situation and is able to relax. This technique of systematic desensitization is used widely 
and has met with a lot of success while dealing with phobias and anxiety issues. The next technique is aversive therapy. Aversive therapy is used in cases where you want to remove an unwanted positive emotional response. It is exclusively used or it is widely used in the area of addictions like alcoholism or smoking. In this situation, punishment is used instead of reinforcement. Commonly used aversive therapies are shock therapy, it is widely used in the case of alcoholism or a pill may be given to an alcoholic after the consumption of alcohol which makes the person nauseous thereby creating an unpleasant feeling towards the behavior. It is important to remember that creating an unpleasant emotion or consequence to this behavior alone is not enough, but the person must be trained to adapt positive behaviors also. The next technique that we are going to look at would be operant conditioning techniques. The earlier techniques we were looking at were classical conditioning techniques which focused on the emotional aspects. Now we are going to look at behaviors which are more voluntary. For example, stealing or not eating. Earlier it was emotional as in we looked at fear, anxiety. So, what do we do in situations when the behavior is voluntary? We used operant conditioning techniques such as contingency management and token economies. Contingency management. Contingency management is used to change certain behaviors or remove unhealthy behaviors or unwanted maladaptive behaviors. For example, a child who is not eating. What the therapist does is identify situations in the environment which act as reinforcers for this behavior. Referring to the child who is not eating in the presence of his parents. It might be because of the attention he gets from the parents. It might be because of the snacks he gets before meal time or because of food he does not like. So, the therapist looks at the environment to identify the factors which reinforce this behavior and manage the environment in a way such that the desirable behaviors can be cultivated. So, in this case, the parents can put the plate of food in front of the child, but not give any attention when he is eating. They can also make sure that the child is not given any snack. So, the rewards and punishments are contingent or dependent on the behavior of the child. This is contingency management. The other technique that we are going to look at is token economies. Token economies are widely used in a group setting. This was initially used in the mental health setup or in a mental hospital. This was used with patients who were not taking good care of themselves, not bathing, brushing, had poor hygiene and would not do the chores allotted to them. So, what the hospital staff did was observe what it was that reinforced them and gave tokens out to these patients for good behavior. So, each good behavior gets a token. Now, an individual can collect these tokens and then towards the end or after a specified period of time can exchange these tokens for something that they want. So, going back to the case of the mental hospital, the inmates would be given a token for each time they bathe, they brush their teeth or do their chores and after they collected these tokens, they exchange them for something like going to the shop or going to the mall or going for a movie. So, it is important to identify what it is that reinforces this person. Let us take a quick recap of what we have looked at in behavior therapy. According to behavior therapy, what needs to be changed is behavior. And to change behavior, you all you need to do is use 
learning techniques. So behavior can be learned or unlearned. Same way maladaptive behavior can be learned or unlearned. And the techniques of classical condition, conditioning and operant conditioning are used to achieve this. In the cases of emotional responses where the response is fear, anxiety, we have used classical conditioning and when the behavior was more voluntary, we have used operant conditioning methods. Classical conditioning methods we have looked at were uh, systematic desensitization, aversive therapy, then on the basis of principles of extinction we have looked at implosion and flooding. Implosion where the feared situation is visualized and in flooding where the individual experiences or is put in the actual situation. In systematic desensitization we looked at reciprocal inhibition where an in a response which is not consistent or compatible with anxiety is introduced which is relaxation. So, the patient is trained to undergo progressive muscle relaxation, come up with an anxiety hierarchy and work through the anxiety hierarchy from the lowest anxiety arousing situation to the highest anxiety arousing situation until the patient is able to completely relax. We looked at aversive techniques such as shock treatment or pills for alcoholism which cause them to experience nausea. We looked at operant conditionings like contingency management where the environment is searched for reinforces and managed in a way that the desired behavior can be elicited. And finally, we looked at token economies where tokens can be exchanged upon a later date for a specific reward. Behavior therapy has gained a lot of popularity because it is a very short term treatment compared to psychoanalysis. And unlike psychoanalysis which focuses on the psychosexual stages and focuses on the why of things, behavior therapy focuses on symptom management and thereby the success rate of alleviating symptoms has been higher. So, today we wrap up these two topics on psychotherapy, this classical psychoanalysis and behavior therapy.